this example, I wanted to use a polynomial of uh, degree two. And that's to kind of show you some techniques that you can use to solve problems similar to this. Uh, the problem that we're going to look at is if we just take the limit as x approaches to two, x squared minus three. If you put this in your calculator, you graph it, you find out that this is in fact a nice smooth uh, function. And therefore, if we take a look at two, we can put two in here and say, oh, two squared is four minus three is one. And so you'll see that x, if x is two, then x squared minus three is one. And so our limit in this case, is, uh, if, at least if this is true of the it, says this, uh, then it has to be one. All right, before we get going, we have some things that we have to look at first. We have to look at the, our, our different conditions as to whether or not the limit is there. The first condition was, is it a function? We have to ask ourselves, is this a function? Yes, it's a function. It passes the vertical line test. Okay, two. Do we have a C value? Yes, C is two. It's right there. Three. Do we have a limit value? Yes, we do. It's one. So L is one. Four. Do we have an open interval containing C? Uh, no. In that case, I guess we better choose one. Okay, and the, an, an easy way to do this is to start right off with just one. So if we center ourselves at two, at x equals two, then we're going to be looking at plus one and minus one. So I'm going to choose interval one, three, which is really, oh, and this is, I don't know, I don't want to write that, two minus one and two plus one. In this case, our delta value would be 1. Okay, so our delta value is 1 in this case. Now, it may not be that when we're done. But right now, we have to choose an interval because that's what the definition tells us to do. All right, now that we have those four things that we needed to satisfy, we can take a look at what, what else we might need in case it doesn't fit this nice little uh, delta equals 1 scenario. Okay, so we need to find a delta. Find a delta. So that 0 less than x minus 2 is less than delta implies that f of x, or in this case, uh, x squared minus 3 minus the limit of 1 is less than epsilon. Okay, now very typically, typically, Delta depends on many, many things. It depends on the interval. It depends on the function. And oddly enough, it depends on the epsilon. Okay, so we if it depends on the epsilon, epsilon then we work with the epsilon to find the deltas that we need. And that's going to help drive us in that direction. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's work on epsilon first and see where that takes us. And so let's take a look at this x squared minus 3 minus 1 in absolute values less than epsilon. All right, well, we know that we can go ahead and get rid of the parentheses by subtracting 1. And so what we really get is uh, the absolute value of x squared minus 4 is less than epsilon. Okay, well. Normally, this would be a problem, except for whatever we put in x becomes, you know, whether it's positive or negative, becomes positive because it's squared. So we need to break this up, and we would like to break it up so that we have an x minus 2. Because if we had an x minus 2, now we can start playing with it using our theorems and our properties and, and get some kind of a definition for d in terms of delta in terms of epsilon. So if you recognize it, this is actually the difference of two squares, and therefore it breaks down like this. If x plus 2, x minus 2, less epsilon. But if we bring those out, just like we talked about in our proof, 
when we have the absolute value of x plus 2 times the absolute value of x minus 2 times 1. Okay, so now the thought process here is I want to be I, I want this to be as small as possible. Which means I need this to be even smaller. So if I could, I want to find, if I can, I want to find a maximum value. If I can find a maximum value, that means that I, I can at least get, you know, I, I can get under that. I can always find a way to get under that maximum value. Okay. And so I need to find the maximum value here. Now, when we were talking about it, we also said that I'm working on this interval. I chose the interval. Well, if we look at the maximum value in that interval, we have x is 1, which gives us uh, x plus 2 is 3. We have a 3, a 3 plus 2 is 5. So we know, because it's an open inter interval, we know that x plus 2 must be less than 5. That's true, then let's take that 5. Let's take this 5 and let's shove it in there for x plus 2. Okay, and let's see what happens. So we have the absolute value of 5, which is just 5, minus x minus 2. Now, we know that because we assume that this is less than epsilon, and 5, or x plus 2 has to be less than 5, then that has to be less than x plus 2 x minus 2 less than epsilon. Okay, now this this chain we're not used to. Basically it says we know this is true and we know this is true. So putting the putting those two things together we know that this is true. And you'll notice how the signs are both going the same way. We know that 5 times x minus 2 is less than epsilon. We know that, which is good, because now we can divide by 5, we get x minus 2 uh, in uh, absolute value is less than epsilon over 5. Oh, but wait. Isn't that what we want? So now, delta takes on this thing, where if this is equal to delta, now we have delta is equal to epsilon over 5, or from our assumption on our interval, delta equals 1. And now we want the smallest number because we want to constrain everything. Delta wants to be small so that that forces epsilon to be, or the, the um, it forces the difference between the, the limit and the function value to be even smaller. Okay, no matter what we choose for delta, we can always, if we fed in for x, we're going to squeeze it down. And that's the idea behind this is squeeze. And so it can be one of these two things, but we want the minimum. We want the smallest one that it can be. That forces everything to be that much smaller. So this has to be smaller than the smallest version of this. That way it'll force this to be as small as it can possibly be. And that's how you would uh, that's how you would take a look at that. So don't forget, you need to identify the four things, just like we did here, those four things that we needed in order to even start this process. A very common interval is simply plus or minus one on the center of C. You can see it's the center point. Then we'll go plus 1 and minus 1, and that'll set up our interval. That will force delta to be 1 in that case. Okay, after, and after we have our interval, now we can set up the delta epsilon definition, and we will typically work, epsilon, or work the epsilon side of things to find the delta. So we're kind of working backwards in, in uh, uh, what could be considered an inverse fashion. And then once we're done, have to go through and show it. But at this point, we're good. So this is the answer that we're looking for.